properly, but I want to um, I'm going to give people a few more minutes to uh, sign up, right. and uh, we'll, uh, we'll we'll go from there. All right, we're going to get started in about one more minute. We've got our panelists signing on board here, and uh, just making sure that technology is all up and running for what promises to be a great uh, policy session on an increasingly important consumer issue uh, facing, frankly, all of us. All right, let me get, I'm going to get ready to start some housekeeping things before we kind of kick off the, pro, uh, the presentation to the broader group here. Um, like I said, uh, at the, the top of the hour here, I want to thank everyone for joining us for another edition of Public Leadership Institute's uh, Policy Leadership series, uh, Sessions. Um, this particular one entitled uh, The Right to Repair a New Movement Emerges. And we're going to be talking about this from a consumer advocate point of view and specifically as it relates to policy changes being advanced at the state uh, level around the country. Uh, my name is Dave Woodward. Um, welcome back for those who've attended before, and welcome for those who this might be the first um, uh, first session you're tuning in uh, for. Um, I'm the National Network Director with the Public Leadership Institute. I'm also a county official and former state legislator, and I have the great honor of serving as um, your host uh, today and be fielding any questions um, that you may have about today's presentation. Little background, if, if this is your first time joining us, the Public Leadership Institute's a nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, policy and leadership center, really focused about bringing public uh, awareness and attention to a lot of key issues, particularly around the areas of equity and justice. And we work with public leaderships, like many of yourselves, to uh, improve the economic and social conditions for everyone. Um, you can get a lot of our information um, by going to our website at publicleadershipinstitute.org. Um, there you will find a host of publications. Uh, many that are I mean, pictured there right on your screen that are available for download free or most of the publications are available to be um, purchased on Amazon if you would like a hard printed copy, um, a, a printed edition of some of these communication tools, um, uh, policy manuals and advocacy um, uh, 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 books and toolkits to be more effective in advancing your work. We do really want these sessions to be as value added as possible to help support your leadership uh, in your uh, state and local community. Um, to that end, we've got a number of ways that people can participate in today's session. Um, we have, uh, if you are joining us by uh, um, uh, have audio capabilities, um, we would love you to be able to ask your questions of our very talented panelists, which I'm going to introduce in just a minute, by clicking on the hand icon and put you in the queue and then happy to um, unmute you when we um, allow for plenty of Q&A over the course of today's presentation. I also realize that people join us from a variety of locations and so sometimes typing questions in questions in is easier. Uh, type your questions in the question bar and we'll take those questions as they come in. And you've got my email there on the board, um, dwoodward at publicleadershipinstitute.org. Feel free to email me if there are questions that come up even after that we conclude today. We will be putting this up in our um, web channel, um, but we will uh, but if there are questions that come be between and after that, we'd love to direct them to our wonderful, esteemed panelists that are here joining us uh, this afternoon and, and be happy to do that. 
So today's uh, topic, uh, the right to repair, a new movement emerges, um, really is going to, is, uh, I mean, as you, when you all signed up, um, that recognizing it's getting harder and harder to repair the stuff that we already own, stuff that we paid, in some cases, top dollar to have. And that's why, and many of that's by design. And frankly, it adds cost to consumers and contributes to needless waste, especially um, electronic waste, which is toxic and expensive as a process to deal with as, as itself. Um, that's why a group of consumers, repair enthusiasts, and businesses are getting behind this right to repair or fair, rep uh, fair repair reforms to give people the independent business uh, businesses access to what they need to fix the stuff that we're buying replacement parts tools repair manuals diagnostic software and so this webinar really is gonna um, be talking about leaders in this movement um, to really talk about what is being done what can we do what what more can we do um, to um, bring um, this topic um, uh, front and center um, and achieve the policy changes ne necessary to uh, really relieve or provide more pro-consumer policies um, to improve the conditions for all of us. To that end, let me introduce um, uh, our first panelist, Nathan Proctor. Um, who directs U.S. Purge's uh, Right to Repair campaign. Nathan's 13-year advocacy and organizing experience includes managing the Public Interest Network's online lab, uh, a testbed for advanced online campaign tactics, and overseeing communications for um, uh, CalPurg, uh, based in California, um, the Environment um, Environment California, and a number of other advocacy organizations. Uh, graduate of Tufts University, he lives in Arlington, Massachusetts, with his wife and two children. Children. Nathan, thank you very much for being with us today. Glad to be here. Yeah, great. Let me introduce uh, two more of our panelists that will be joining us. Um, first, we have uh, Kyle Weens, uh, who is the CEO of iFixit, uh, the free um, the free rep repair manual. He's dedicated his life to defeating the second law of thermo thermodynamics, a battle fought in the courtroom as often as in the workshop. iFixit empowers millions of people to repair their broken stuff every single month. Um, he's testified on electronic exports to the International Trade Commission and is actively involved in developing being global environmental standards. The Right to Repair campaign has so far successfully legalized cell phone unlocking and tractor repair. So we're glad to have Kyle with us. I think he'll be joining us in just a moment. And last but not least, um, we're very fortunate to have Gay Gordon Byrne, uh, who's the executive director at the Repair Association. The Repair Association has been instrumental in fighting for the right to repair in the Congress and, and, and in the states. It was, um, it was uh, this team that won the right to unlock cell phones, including having the um, uh, having to muscle a bill through, through through Congress to achieve that. It is um, their team that won the multiple exemption requests in front of the U.S. Copyright Office to unlock cell phone tablets and other mobile devices. And it was, uh, the, I mean, this, the, this organization's leadership's deliberate plan to file copyright exemption requests to allow tinkering with land-based motor vehicles on behalf of, martyr, of modern agriculture. Um, a true champion for consumers. Gay, thank you for being with us today as well. Hey, happy to be here. Great. Well, like I said, that I mean, we're gonna dig deep into this right to repair movement and what it is. And to that end, I'm gonna hand over controls to Nathan, who will kind of like give us a give us an overall framework of what this what this uh, right to repair campaign is about, and then um, and bring Kyle and Gay into the conversation as it's happening. Awesome. Well, thank you uh, for that introduction. Uh, I'm Nathan Proctor. I'm the I work with US Perg um, on the Right to Repair campaign. I'm just trying to. Okay, here we go. Um, excellent. Okay. Oh, I have this little thing. This is probably getting in your way. Um, I think you know Right to Repair reforms have been introduced all over the country. So you know, there's a lot of people who might be dealing with this issue right now. Um, and we want to talk about kind of the way people experience the underlying problems of the barriers that exist to repair, um, why we need new laws to protect repair, uh, how our model legislation works, and you know why it matters. And we'll, we'll pause for questions, I think about halfway through, as is the tradition here. 
Um, so, so please do kind of realize that halfway through this, I, I'll, get, I'll pause to give you an opportunity to ask questions. Um, I did want to start with uh, a story which I thought uh, kind of introduced a lot of people to the issue of um, the need for this. So in August, in December of uh, 2017, Apple got caught um, and admitted that they were slowing down iPhones by throttling the processors um, if the phones had a battery that was worn down. Um, this is included in a software update um, to the phone, um, which you know if you have an iPhone is pretty difficult to avoid. Um, and they did it without telling customers. They only kind of owned up to it after others had figured the issue out. Um, so now a lot of people are upset about this. You know, the idea of Apple slowing down your phone without telling you, um, you know, kind of got rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. So even even if they were just trying to address the performance issues related to old batteries and not, you know, say covertly pushing people to upgrade their poorly selling uh, new iPhones, um, it was a pretty sneaky way to do it. Um, you know, why, why not tell people that their batteries needed replacing and let them choose what to do? Um, you know, batteries are basically the one part of your phone that's guaranteed to wear out. You know, they last about 500 charges, according to Apple. And, uh, you know, that's a year and a half of daily charging, probably two years. Um, you know, and after people had figured out what was wrong, um, they wanted their batteries fixed. They just wanted their phones working again. And so Apple ended up offering a reduced, pat, uh, you know, price for their batteries. Um, but they couldn't keep up with the demand. You know, run, don't walk to replace your iPhone battery for $29. Huge wait list formed. Some people were being told that they were going to have to wait three, four months before Apple could slot them in. So people started to um, kind of look elsewhere. Uh, and, and that kind of brings us to a report by US Perk earlier this year called Recharge Repair. Um, we found that despite the fact that Apple was offering these low-cost battery repairs, um, there is a huge increase in the desire for independent repair. Uh, we surveyed 164 small businesses with help from iFixit and the Repair Coalition, uh, and we found a 37% surge in battery replacement requests after this announcement by Apple was made. There was also a 153% increase in traffic to the um, self-repair instructions uh, available on iFixit.com. Um, and so, you know, this, this problem could have easily been resolved if Apple had allowed the 60,000 small electronics repair shops in America to repair the batteries on these phones. But they set up a bunch of hurdles to make that difficult or impossible. Um, they don't make the original batteries for repair available to customers or third parties. They don't provide the diagnostic software that's used uh, to, to check battery health um, that you can use at the Apple Store. Um, they don't provide the service manuals, um, and they use uh, proprietary tools. They make this funny penelope screwdriver uh, to make it uh, kind of a hassle to unscrew and open the device. So that's kind of what right to repair kind of gets to. Um, you know, right to repair would require original equipment manufacturers, what we call the OEMs, to provide access to the parts, tools, schematics and diagnostics to fix our stuff um, on fair and reasonable terms um, and that the definition of fair and reasonable uh, Nathan I think we might have lost sound Nathan may have jumped can. out. Hey, this is Kyle. I can I can step in and fill in the fair and no, reasonable no, no. definition. Nathan, are you back? Yeah. Okay. We lost you for a sec. Go for it. Oh, okay. Um, I was like, so a company like iFixit can sell you the replacement battery special tools. Their their, rep their online repair manual is fantastic. Um, but you know, the, there's hundreds of millions of iPhones. There's a lot of products that there aren't a hundred millions of copies of. And, you know, even even if right to repair would have meant that the throttle gate would have been solved, you know, within days instead of the logistical nightmare that a lot of people experience, you know, still to this day, I have an old battery on my phone, but I, you know, I haven't bothered to take it to the Apple store. So I'm just kind of limping it along. Um, 
you know, there are many products that don't have that same kind of, uh, the, you just can't find the parts, you know? And so if you're the manufacturer, you might charge an incredibly price gouging amount, uh, or you might just not sell it and, and force someone to trash something when they just have broken a small part, you know, it right. adds to, it adds to waste. That's what we're seeing oh, with devices. I mean, there's over 5,000 different Android phones on the market. And you have a lot of these Asian manufacturers that will come in and they're, they're almost dumping products on the market. And they don't they don't behave with the same level of responsibility that an American manufacturer would. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, so anyway, going on. So and, and so when we talk a little bit about where our bill came from um, and kind of history of right to repair. So, I mean, the, the whole story of repair kind of goes back a long way, but specifically where, where this bill came from was in 2012, uh, Massachusetts voters approved a ballot measure um, to create automotive right to repair, um, which guarantee, basically guaranteed that when your car has a problem, you can take it to anybody and not just the dealership. Is There was a battle between um, independent repair and then also the parts manufacturers like napa and you know the tires and the dealerships um who were trying to increasingly make the those repairs proprietary um and squeeze out the rest of the market and um it was a big enough deal that you know that it, it came to the ballot in massachusetts and uh thanks to that state law there was a national agreement between the dealerships and these other independent purveyor proprietors that means that you can take your car anywhere to get it fixed that your local mechanic can still get access to the same repair information as the dealership um and so because congress has been basically been increasingly worse on kind of defending our rights to repair things and and letting companies get away with more um this this template kind of gave us a new way to move forward uh that would namely action in the states um so um, let me just pause here for questions if you have questions about the way the law works um and then after that i can talk a little bit more about um you know why why this bill it matters and, and kind of where it's going and Nathan, I got uh, a first question here from uh, Ann. I can't like, it, like N S. I don't. I mean, this how it comes up the screen. Um, that I mean, I think this happened actually a little bit when you went out uh, the first time around this fair and reasonable standard. Can you can you talk a little bit about what that was? I, I think you might have been blocked out the sound that we didn't hear. I think you were starting to explain okay. what that means. And so maybe if you can go over and give a, a re, uh, kind of go over that again. I would say Gay can probably give the most concise explanation of what that is. Great. Um, it means that there's a whole series of requirements that Massachusetts created that said it's you you must if fair and reasonable is determined based on um, all a laundry list of different criteria, and that was all agreed by the auto manufacturers and the dealerships and the independent parties. Um, it's not been challenged as an unreasonable way to come about it, and it's in statute in uh, Massachusetts, and nobody's really argued about it being an inappropriate um, way to come about fair and reasonable. Bottom line is that um, if you if 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 you have a feeling that a part should cost 20 bucks and you're being charged 600 bucks, and that's more than the original price of the product, uh, chances are it wouldn't meet the fair and reasonable standard. Um, it will try to keep a lid on the rationality of prices for parts. One thing that's nice about being able to build on top of the success of the Massachusetts legislation is that that legislation wasn't drafted in a vacuum. It was the result of years of negotiation between the auto manufacturers and the aftermarket. And and the electronics bill that we're working with is is, is substantially similar to the the auto agreement. So it's uh, this uh, the the reference legislation is the result of extensive negotiation and compromise. Um, with manufacturers already, which I think puts us in a good place. There's going to be less, I think, back and forth with the manufacturers on this one. We're already coming in with pretty sound policy. Great. Um, got another uh, question that's coming from Kevin, a uh, legislator in, in Nevada, that um, asks, is, has there been man a, a significant manufacturing pushback in the wake of 
um, the Massachusetts um, passing passing its original bill uh, to weaken weaken the approved uh, ballot measure. Yeah. So um, um, Jay, um, okay. I could I could speak to that. So far as we know, not um, the the auto industry aftermarket association um, has been evaluating whether or not compliance has been good with the legislation and they are not complaining. I would I would suggest that that means that it's working. Um, uh, we know that there's a few foot draggers out there um, on various parts of compliance, but by and large, nobody's challenged the bill in court saying this is unconstitutional or it's inappropriate for states or it's, uh, it's somehow wrong. Um, they seem to be pretty happy with it. Right, and there hasn't been legislation introduced to reverse this. Actually, after Massachusetts passed the bill, the auto manufacturers agreed to apply that bill nationwide. Uh, so now we have a memorandum of, of understanding between the auto manufacturers and the aftermarket in addition to the state law. Uh, so it was a very effective tool. It, I think it really shows the power that the states have to uh, to set forward-looking uh, public policy that, that has the ability to impact um, more uh, – more trade than just what's happening inside the state. Great. Um, we got a question here from uh, Marvin that poses, and I just want to I, I read this. Is, uh, how about um, the movement where the company says it isn't really selling you a product when it sells you a, sells you a product, like uh, um, starting with a C and software um, that's that's being spread in there, I mean, kind of like the Monsanto. I mean, argument, and so it's a, it's claiming that a, the proprietary ownership of these parts. Like, is this? A, a, have you? A, how have that? Ha, how has that tension been resolved? Of the I mean, owning the proprietary thing that's absolutely essential to run the product, but you obviously have parts that are necessary to run it. Yes, that's a great question, and that's something that we're increasingly concerned about. As part of this discussion, John Deere told farmers that they didn't really own the software and the tractor. They just had an implied license to operate the vehicle, uh, and clearly that's not okay. Uh, we're running up against – I mean, and this is going to happen more and more over the next decade, where the, the sort of – rights that we come to expect with personal property are not the same rights that we have with intellectual property. And as uh, software and electronics are, move into everything, uh, it's it's going to be hard to buy any product 10 years from now that doesn't have a microchip in it. We need legislation like this to to reset the balance. Uh, one of the things that, that this bill does... I mean, does you can imagine a situation where you bought a refrigerator and um, it has some smart capacity and then the... You know, you've had the refrigerator for five years, and then the manufacturer decides that the software, they will no longer update the software. So you still have a perfectly functional refrigerator, but you can't operate it because the software is no longer supported. Um, and Right to Repair gets to some of these issues by giving you access to, to – um, it, it's included in the things you get access to, but the, these are these will be issues that we will need to fight about for a while. Um, companies have just been – have gotten way too aggressive. Um, in the way that they kind of use software to control obsolescence. Yeah, I think you can think of this as the first step in the direction to restore the property rights balance. That's a great way of thinking about it. If people have any uh, additional questions, uh, feel free to click on the hand icon to ask your questions live to our very esteemed panelists or type questions in the question bar and we'll um, be happy to bring them up. I mean, uh, like not getting any questions that are coming through. So, Nathan, okay. you wanna, yeah. hey, why don't we move forward? If people have any questions, we can always go back. And so type yeah. questions in or raise your hand. And the next time we pause, we will get to those questions. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, we talked about, touched on some of this with your questions, but, you know, why this is an issue that is not just, um, it's an issue that has profundity, I guess it would be one way to say it. Um, you know, and I, I we have a huge e-waste problem and it's growing all the time. You know, on average, Americans throw out 350,000 cell phones every day. Um, there's Globally, there's some 50 million metric tons of e-waste um, generated, um, they expect, in 2018. You know, may, many of these items are fixable. 
many of these items could be repaired and refurbished and and you know be made to be useful um, but uh, but tech dump which is one of the organizations in, in the network um, that um, hires people uh, to, to refurbish electronics finds that about 14% of the stuff that gets donated to them um, can be fixed um, and 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 a lot of it would be that number would be increased if, if we could pass right to repair um, you know there's three billion people in the world that don't have access to a cell phone and Americans are throwing out 350,000 cell phones a day uh, E-waste is highly toxic. You know, it, it contains lead, cadmium, and mercury. Um, and there's increasing research that shows um, just what a huge global warming impact we're making with our disposable electronics. Um, you know, a, a report um, that I saw came out over the weekend that 85 to 95 percent of the carbon footprint um, uh, is mining and manufacturing for for small electronic devices like cell phones. Um, and that, that, that their portion of global warming pollution that can be uh, attributed to cell phones has gone from like 1% to like 14% of global, uh, you know, carbon emissions. Um, so it's a huge environmental problem. You know, and, and now cell phone manufacturers, we, we were tweeting about it today, all of us. <laughs> but uh, the eight, Sprint and AT&T are now marketing this new cell phone every year plan. Um, they, you know, they're really pushing to make cell phones a, a essentially a disposable product. Um, you know, the, the other thing that's important to realize about right to repair is that um, it creates a lot of local employment. Um, there's 60,000 um, local electronic shops in America, um, but as co companies make stuff impossible to repair or they try to block repair, these opportunities are going to dry up. Um, this is true for a lot more than cell phones, as we were just talking about, other appliances that now have, you know, kind of computers built into them. Um, you know, this photo is from uh, Tech Discounts of Minnesota, which employs people with significant barriers to reemployment um, because they've experienced incarceration or in addiction recovery. Um, and then it, you know, it, it trains them how to refurbish electronics, which they sell, while teaching them, you know, kind of valuable IT skills um, and, and, and the aid in job placement. So, that, you know, part of the idea of repair is that there's kind of an abundance in efficiency. Um, and you know this is kind of a this is a push towards a more circular way of doing the world, um, a more circ circular economy. Um, it's also you know a kind of important way to train train people on how things work in STEM education. A lot of us that really care about repair have fond memories of like learning how to fix stuff as um, children. Um, this next slide is is from ifixit.org, um, and you know kind of gives you a sense of how much opportunity there is uh, for jobs. Um, you know, expanded repair would create all kinds of new opportunities in communities around the country. Um, we know that automation and some other factors are going to putting a lot of pressure on the world of jobs, and we're going to need to find new ways for people to meet their needs as kind of things change. And creating opportunities with repair is is just a smart thing to do. Um, you know, I, you know, Kyle just talked touched on some of this, but you know, the very idea of kind of ownership is at state. Uh, you know, John Deere did argue that you don't really own your tractor. I mean, farmers are, are paying like their life savings for these tractors. I mean, it's five, six hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment. And, and John Deere is saying that you don't really own it. You're just an implied licensed uh, user. Um, and kind of repair is kind of a way to live in resistance to, um, you know, this idea that these companies should control what we own and what we can do with it. And, and so finally, I just want to go over where we have bills and uh, who supports and opposes as we kind of get into the nuts and bolts of how we run these campaigns. So um, as you can see, this map kind of has highlighted places where the bill has been introduced. It's not, it doesn't go, it's not active in all these places. And, and some of them, they, we just had the bill kind of put on ice. But, um, you know, th there's a number of states where we've had the bill introduced. Actually, South Dakota technically should be on this list, too. Um, uh, you know, in, in terms of supporters, I have them listed there. I can give a quick uh, description, but you know, we have the Repair Association is uh, basically repair and refurbishing businesses and nonprofit organizations that do the work of, um, you know, 
refurbishing unwanted electronics and you know kind of donating them or some of them are just you know working as repair businesses for profit we also have environmental groups consumer rights organizations farmers digital rights organizations which include um kind of people who have an interest in digital literacy and stem uh, and, and addressing the digital divide and then opponents are basically the manufacturers uh, and the dealerships which are kind of authorized sellers um, and then all the other groups that are um, represent those interests like there's like this fake group of people who care about internet security but they're really just representing um, the OEMs uh, so I'll pause there, and we, we can ask questions about about that. But that that's kind of the end of that part of the presentation. So, so I do I mean, the the model for this bill. I mean, is it pretty uniform throughout uh, all of these, or is I mean, through all of these individual states, or it, no. is it um, because of the regulatory environment in the state? Does it I mean, how, how does it shift? I I would say that most most of the difference would have to do with politics. So. Um, there's basically different, you know, we wanted to include all devices. We think you should have a right to repair everything. Um, in some places, uh, you know, for example, in Wyoming, um, the bill that they're looking at there only looks at agriculture equipment. Um, that's that's just what they put the bill forward to do. Um, that's what they cared about. Um, and then in some places they might omit certain um, products basically because of for political reasons to try to cut off part of the opposition that's making it too difficult to pass the bill right and uh, I, Marvin from North Dakota says uh, you can, will be able to add North Dakota to the list uh, start come next January when session resumes so bills drawn up so make sure I'll make sure that you Excellent. guys are connected um, <laughs> <laughs> Just awesome. like that. See, look at we're already growing the map. Um, Fantastic. What, uh, I mean, I guess this gets to again, the broader strategy. I like, guess it is it a coalition that can. I mean, it, it, consumer groups coming together to. I mean, in the supporter column, to identify what. I mean, maybe what industries or the full scope of this, or is it policy leaders say that we need to do this? We clearly need to be doing this, and. Um, that kind of like bring it, bring it forward. I guess what is it's it, how I what what has been some of the successful models to get? I mean, this very pro-consumer policy front and center in these individual states. Yeah, I mean, I, Gay can probably speak to this the best, but I mean, it's kind of the ice was broken, and then people just started showing up and put, putting these bills forward. Yeah, one thing yeah, that's worked well much. is that Go ahead, Kyle. We, we've been able to work across the aisle uh, in, in a lot of these states, like in Wyoming, for example, we, the bills have been introduced by Republicans. Uh, this is a, uh, depending on who you're talking to, this is a you know, local self-reliance issue. It's about creating more local jobs. It's about uh, providing competition where there's currently a monopoly. Uh, and 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 then it's also about consumer rights and and improving the environment. So I think that's that's part of why we've seen so much success is that we're not really pigeonholed into any one ideological uh, position. I think the other aspect um, is that a lot of people have been very personally frustrated by repair monopolies that they experience on a daily basis, and mm -hmm. once they find out, um, either through a colleague or reading an article. Um, that there's a solution to these monopolies and they're not stuck, uh, they tend to be pretty excited and they will reach out either to people that they've read about or to us and say, how do we file a bill? And just like the gentleman from North Dakota said he has a bill ready, these have been very viral efforts. We have not, I mean, we kicked off the first, um, the first few bills, but most of them have come about as a result of discussions between legislators in different states and not directly because of us. So we're very happy to see that because it shows that the problems of monopolies that we've been raising the alarm about are in fact um, as alarming to everybody else as they are to us. Great. Is there, uh, I mean, among, particularly among bill sponsors or coalitions that are helping support individual and individual state, uh, is there 
some coordination or sharing of best practices uh, to help support the advancement of those? I mean, obviously, it's going to be different based on um, based on individual state, but it, it just as um, I think Kyle I mentioned, given the the broad appeal across the political spectrum around these, uh, it, it seems like it would lend itself to creating space to draw on resources to help support this. Yes, we've been able to build a pretty good playbook. Uh, we we can provide uh, sponsors, anybody who's working on it, with uh, example letters from the opposition before they get going. Uh, we are able to, when, once a state introduces the bill, we're able to turn on our grassroots network. Uh, I fix it has a few hundred thousand members across the country, um, and we've, I mean, just. Well, just in the last week, we've sent, we've seen our members write a thousand letters to legislators across the country. Uh, so we're able to get some kind of grassroots activism going once we know that we've got boots on the ground in the state to introduce a bill. Right. We've also got um, among these supporting organizations, some of them, as you know, for example, Nathan and um, the various public interest research groups and consumers union and some of the other groups are are very well organized nationally um, the, the um, American Farm Bureau Federation very well organized um, and they're in very consistent support of these bills in the local legislatures so it, it's really we're, we're almost like the umbrella and like the um, the orchestrator as opposed to um, anything else. I mean, we can only do so much guidance and help as much as we can, but it really winds up so far being a largely grassroots effort um, up against very organized lobbyists. Great. Uh, I got a question here from Danielle in, in Georgia asking, we're I, I, seeing the opponents, particularly I mean, as manufacturers as opponents, uh, how do Chamber of Commerce uh, entities uh, play into all of this? It would seem to me that they I mean, they might get split across supporters and opponents based on based on industry and member. Um, but can you speak to that? Sure. We've seen um, chambers in some states come out in opposition, and we've seen mostly silence. Um, the National Federation of Independent Businesses has been more consistently favorable, uh, but it depends on who the members are and how much money they have to influence the position of the organization. Uh, chambers tend to be dominated by larger companies, NFIB by smaller companies. So you can see there's a bit of a, um, there's a bit of a mismatch. Right. Yeah, mostly the, the opposition will show up at the hearing room, et cetera, as you know, this local manufacturers association, um, but they're, they're representing the OEMs. I mean, a, a good question to ask whenever they show up at a hearing would be like, well, how many people manufacturing things in this state would this apply to? <laughs> right. it's probably zero. Right. Uh, Gabrielle is asking the, the question, of where do they get access to model bill like, uh, legislation? The model bill legislation is available at repair.org. Um, if you go onto, is it about legislation? And then there's a link for it. Um, obviously, uh, we can provide that in 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 whatever. Um, uh, but yeah, it's it's pretty easy to find. Great. It's very easy to find. Plus, all of the active bills are up on Legiscan, and um, they're all it's, it's, to the earlier question. They're all extremely similar. There are variations. Um, it, based on which statutes are general business law, which kinds of enforcement um, the maybe the AG's office prefers, one kind of fine to a different kind of enforcement, they, they wind up being customized in those particulars, but they're all pretty much the same. So you could take a look at any of the bills that are posted up on Registan and see a rough template. We once you take a look at that, there's some you know every time we come up against a new objection. Somebody some usually makes a, a useful suggestion on how language can be improved, and we could provide you with the latest updates. 
Yeah, if you go to repair.org, it's under the advocacy header and then legislation, and you can download a Word file. Right. Um, I guess, I mean, you brought up like I mean, enforcement issues, like I mean, from the the AG's perspective and other types of things. Has I, I whether the Association of uh, Attorney Generals, um, or I guess I mean others, I like, try to weigh in, particularly on in the absence of bills. Is there other? Is there other? Uh, I, I guess. Uh, other strategies to help achieve the same thing. So obviously getting, I mean, getting bill, creating new law, put out the framework of, I mean, a regulatory environment. Um, but I mean, have attorney generals, for instance, like brought suit to ensure these types of things. To my knowledge, no. Um, what we found is the state's attorneys general generally get brought in by the bill sponsors when the bills look like they're, moving and they want to get the approval of the AG's office before they write the final um, language to be presented in a committee. Um, I've not seen the AGs take a direct stance against manufacturers, although some of the bills that, or some of the court actions that are being filed um, against Apple specifically may, may get into that area, but they're going to be pretty targeted towards, say, batteries. Uh, mm -hmm. We've also been trying for years to try to get the um, the environmental standards groups to write better legislation or create better standards that will be more focused on repair, and that has been a huge, a huge disappointment. Um, not because we aren't doing the work and because people don't understand, but the way most standards organizations are, are, are actually functional is the OEMs have a big vote. And so we'll get a standard put together, and then it goes out to balloting, and the OEMs say, absolutely not. And so the standards are not moving. Um, it, the standards really haven't been improved in many years, and they're not going to be. Uh, OEMs are preventing it. Got it. Yeah, w one thing, one on another way that people have been putting pressure on the manufacturers, and this is kind of, um, some of it's coming come out of Apple's big reveal that they had this um, new iPad that they wanted to sell in schools and then uh, uh, iFixit kind of flunked that same device in terms of repairability. Um, iFixit does these teardowns and repairability scores which you should totally check out is um, you know people are you kind of making reference to repairability and the things that companies are doing when they got into purchasing. Um, and, and this, I think this is a good opportunity for kind of any any level of government to kind of do some advocacy on the ways manufacturers are kind of trying to block repair. I mean, if Apple fails their big reveal of their iPad because it's an unfixable mess and no school wants it, um, I think that, that that's a, as good a message as we can send to them as we can with the market. Yeah, one of the interesting trends with consumer electronics recently is is everything, of course, has a battery, and the batteries are integrated. In order to make devices thinner, the manufacturers have started gluing in the batteries, uh, and of course, that that creates challenges, like what we're seeing around the iPhone. Uh, it creates challenges for users because you have to replace your battery every 18 months, and if it's glued in, the manufacturer won't give you a battery or won't sell you a battery, then you're forced to go back to them. Uh, it's also causing significant challenges at recycling, and we're seeing more and more municipal uh, uh, recycling facilities. Uh, we're seeing um, uh, electronic specialty recyclers have have fires. So what happens is normally they they take electronics apart and they run them through a shredder. You can't put a battery through a shredder uh, without causing a fire. And so it's causing very expensive, time-consuming manual disassembly where the recyclers have to pull apart every single iPad that comes in and, and like use a spatula or a pry bar to pry the battery out and hope it doesn't catch on fire in the process. Um, it's, it's increasingly difficult. We had a, uh, a very expensive multi-million dollar fire at a Bay Area in California recycler that was caused by a lithium battery. And you're going to see more and more of these. I was speaking this morning with a group of waste management professionals across California that are increasingly frustrated. Uh, and so I think you're going to see municipalities and uh, recycling organizations get more and more vocal as batteries are moving into more and more products. 
Great. Uh, I guess related to that, obviously, state legislation being introduced to set, I mean, the, the, the regulatory environment for that respective state, but I mean, in, in, in kind of you jumped into this, there's definitely a, a space for, I mean, leaders at a more local level to be weighed into this to really help amplify the voice for change that helps contribute to a more pro-consumer or at least balancing, rebalancing to a fairer um, consumer uh, structure. And so, I mean, do we, is there a lot of examples in where like local communities have been weighing in on, uh, in these respective states uh, to uh, push these, these policies? I think you're already seeing schools voting with their pocketbooks. Schools have substantially switched away from using Apple products to using Chromebooks over the last five years. And it's like Apple used to make really repairable, really easy to disassemble products. And it's interesting as they've gone toward these glued in products that are made out of glass, the schools have gone the other direction to Chromebooks that are very easy and straightforward to repair. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's an example where, where schools are voting with their pocketbooks. Well, it also gets me to start thinking about uh, as you think about through procurement policy and things like this. I mean, I'm, I mean, smaller communities and everything that don't have the, the, all the tech consultants at their their fingertips. It's it seems like a very uh, important question to to ask to be injected into that the the, the, um, the conversation to I mean, allow more people to vote with their pocketbooks and and where they go. Right. So that's. Um, right, and and the challenge, the normal way that you would do that is you'd rely on a standard, something like a green standard, to define. You'd say we're only going to procure, procure products that are on those green standards. Unfortunately, despite about ten years of trying, uh, none of the green electronic standards factor in repairability, and that's been because the manufacturers have rigged uh, the process for developing those standards. So there there isn't a objective tool that the companies can use. We are seeing organizations like Greenpeace coming out and rating manufacturers based on their repairability now. Uh, so there is some outside information that you can look at, but there is, unfortunately, uh, it's been strategic on the manufacturer's part. There isn't uh, one easy place that you can go and say, okay, this product is okay to procure. Interesting. Yeah, from a corporate per corporate per procurement perspective, um, there are sustainability groups that are trying to make corporate corporate uh, procurement executives aware of the difficulties and the extra cost of repair um, and it just it's a long-term education process it's just not easy to get across to people that they aren't as safe as they thought they were if they just buy the big branding I mean it used to be that you couldn't get hurt buying um, IBM you know you you might get hurt buying some off-brand but you could never do badly by buying IBM however that has changed um, you know, there are, manu there are an, in every industry, there are manufacturers that are friendly re towards repair and those that are unfriendly towards repair. And teasing out those terms and conditions is very hard, uh, particularly for the unskilled or, or the, those that aren't looking for it. So it is, it's a big education process and conversations like this are very important. I know, I agree. All right, I think those are the, all the questions that we have. I mean, Nathan, is there? I mean, can we talk a little bit, maybe more about the kind of the tools available to help support the campaign? Or I, I don't know if you've got more in your your slide presentation here. Oh no, no, that that was that was it. Um... Well, I mean, well, I guess another question is like, is there um, a, a toolkit to help support, I mean, whether it's leveraging through social media to get even more consumers engaged yeah. in this debate. Can you, I mean, can you talk a little bit about, I mean, I saw some of the, uh, the memes earlier in, in your presentation that were lifted up there. Where do, I mean, where do they, can consumer groups, policy leaders and others go to really tap into and make sure that they're also connected to all the other activity that's happening? I mean, the three of us are probably the you are it. you are the movement. <laughs> you know, um, so I th I think especially if 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 you want to do uh, the a bill in the state that does not have has never introduced one before, uh, like Kyle was saying that that they have um, the they they can use iFixit to drive uh, support for that bill, and so you want to make sure that you t talk with Kyle before. Um, that happens, and then and then we do have just a lot of n networks, and we have a lot of people who've worked with us um, 
and and have you know branches etc in every state so if you want a kind of staple of who to talk to um you really should go to the three of us and then we can kind of hook you up with the groups that are in your state that that have already kind of engaged in some way great and repair.org has everything you need so perfect um I mean, I, I have another question, and I'm going to take all the questions. But if you guys aren't writing questions, I'm going to ask them. Uh, at the at the federal level, so I, I mean, we're at what, 20 something. I mean, closing in on half the country in which legislation is introduced, obviously of varying degrees. And we've learned that our, our um, uh, leader and in, uh, um, in uh, North Dakota to, to add to, to that list. Uh, I mean, it seems. That we're starting quickly getting to a, a tipping point that's going to fuel further uh, congressional action, or at least legislation introduced at a congressional level to um, where the state activity often it helps create the momentum for a, a national solution to this problem. Um, can, can you speak a little bit to that and again where that sits in the in the mix, or is where, is it very quiet at the national level? This is something that that firmly, I think, the control for this uh, belongs at the state level. Um, you know, states regulate commerce. This is this is, I think, the right place to do that. Uh, the the other right to repair folks did try to do right to repair at the federal level um, for several years before they moved to a state strategy. Um, I, yeah, at the federal level, the the large corporations have so much influence over the process. It's it's very challenging to get something done. Um, that's not to say that it can't be done. I mean, we, uh, Gay and I worked um, a few years ago and we were able to get a bill uh, through Congress that uh, President Obama signed that legalized cell phone unlocking that made it so that you could move a cell phone from AT&T to Verizon or so a soldier could take a cell phone overseas with them. Uh, and that was a hugely pro-consumer, pro-environment bill. Um, but that, I think, was the exception, not the rule. It's very challenging to get something done. Mm-hmm. And coming, uh, I mean, a, a question I posed, and, and we look at this list of supporters and opponents. Um, I mean, those that uh, forces that oppose almost any form of uh, of regulation, and I mean, specifically, it's been lifted up, like Alec, um, weighing into these fights. I mean, across the country, um, either fueling their supporters in those respective states to organize and work against, or worse. Um, I mean, weakening um, ability to put these pro-consumer policies in place. Uh, can you speak to a little bit? Have, have you seen that come into play yet, uh, um, or I mean, do you anticipate it? Um, what are I mean, some of the maybe strategies and approaches to prevent, or in some cases, like out-organize? Um, yeah. Run those forces. I mean, I think I, I think you got to it right there. I think if we if we're doing it right, then we can flank them. Um, we we all know that. You know, Alec is is more of a tool of big money to control local politics than it is a, a genuine, uh, you know, kind of, you know, policy, you know, perspective. It, it, but we, we, you know, like these issues are universal. You know, like people should be able to fix their own stuff, and there's no reason why somebody who believes in individual rights would be against. You know, if if we organize the coalition we can kind of take away the kind of way that this might split, um, you know, kind of traditional into the traditional trench warfare of American politics. Um, but we still have to, it, it, I mean, to me, this issue fits firmly in the special interest, public interest kind of fight. And, um, and it's, it's wise for us to kind of keep it in that territory, you know, like, I, I think to, this is about challenging the power of corporations to tell us what to do, um, and to and to you know use the use their power to to kind of overcharge us and to kind of force us to to waste. Right. Well, and this is just a common sense issue. Everyone is on board with this issue. I mean, in Massachusetts, when it was actually a ballot initiative, people got a vote. Eighty-seven percent of the popular vote went in favor of the bill. I think six percent voted against it. Uh, it, it this is just it, when people ask us who's against this, there's no human that is against this bill. <laughs> there are just <laughs> corporate entities that are against it. But even inside of Apple, I would I would bet that most of their employees would probably be in favor of it. Right. <laughs> 
Well, as an example of some of the absurdities of being in opposition, we've literally seen John Deere get in front of legislators and say, we think this is a great bill for consumers and their cell phones, but not tractors. And then we've seen the inverse. We've seen Apple get in front of legislators today. This is a great bill for farmers to be able to fix their tractors. <laughs> but we shouldn't we shouldn't be fixing cell phones. phones. It's it's that <laughs> insane. And it, and Kyle is absolutely right. There's no humans that um, don't want to fix their stuff. If from from rich to poor, um, the most ardent libertarian to the most ardent liberal, everybody needs to fix their stuff and they understand it's gonna cost them a heck of a lot more if they can't and people are very motivated for their wallets and it, on top of it this is actually genuinely green I mean, we don't even have anybody saying we're being too green I mean this is it's absurd to say that you can't fix your stuff and then turn around and say but I want to be I want to be lauded as a green manufacturer which is the absurdity of what Apple is doing right now where they're saying Gee, we're wonderful. We're going to make everything recyclable at some point in the future. Aren't we wonderful? And we're like, well, how about letting people fix their phones now? These are these are really simple things for consumers, and everybody everybody is a consumer. Right. And I would let me go a step further in saying that, and, and, and we have a lot of policy conversations around a whole host of issues in these these sessions um, every other week, and uh, this is that one that automatically lends itself to answering the question what uh, what's in it for you like how do you directly benefit from this and i i think the ability to organize um around this and not just build or I mean, formal um coalitions and support um but to engage the public i mean i just i mean i i, I pity the policy leader that gets out in front and says no this is bad uh, <laughs> Because I, uh, how you, I mean, you potentially have the ability to unleash the public, uh, to hold that person accountable, um, is, is is phenomenal. So it, I, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I want to, I mean, thank all three of you, and I think uh, uh, for a few that I mean, doing during, during the course of the presentation, um, these are, I mean, the three leaders that uh, can help. Um, be a an asset to to your work to advancing this. I would like us to see if we can convene this conversation um, a year from now and see that map that we just saw had on the screen um, with uh, this policy introduced in every single state. And I think we're making making gains. And and I know that we definitely will continue to. I mean, I mean, push this information through our network. We've got policy leaders in um, every state around the uh, the country as part of our network. Um, uh, and so, I, again, I just want to thank I mean, Nathan, Gay, Kyle. Thank you for your time, uh, bringing uh, breaking down this I mean, arguably complex issue down to a very simple terms that um, we have we deserve have a right to fix our stuff. I love that. I mean, that meme that talked about uh, you don't really own it unless you can fix it. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah, well, any of us are available, happy to talk to anybody offline. We'll also be at NCSL in LA. Uh, in, All right. In well, we will see summer, you there. So. Happy Fantastic. To see you all, there. all right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, for everyone joining us, thank you for taking the time. Uh, be in touch. And we will I mean, make sure that uh, the links and the information to this model policy is easily made available to each and every one of you. Again, thank you, Nathan, Gay, Kyle. Thank you for your time. And uh, Absolutely. we'll be in touch. All right. Take care. Cheers.